Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. I'm your host for this number 50 show already. Wow, 5-0. Unbelievable that I've done 50 shows already in just over a year. Time flies when you're having fun, folks, and I've been pretty busy, as you've known. It's great to be back in the studio again. I've uh, been doing a lot of road testing and traveling, so I've got a few stories to catch up on. Um, I've been mainly tweeting a lot of stuff in my absence to try to continue with some information feed, so if you're not following me on Twitter, please do. I do, I'm pretty active on Twitter to try to get stories out that I don't necessarily will cover on this show. Some I do, some I don't. But to keep the information flowing, please follow me on Twitter. And all my contact information will be coming up at the end of the show. But let's get right into today's episode. First, I want to do a quick follow-up to my last show, which was the Nissan Leaf E Plus review episode that I did fairly comprehensive. I had a chance to spend a time with the week and uh, a week with the Leaf, and I thought, as I said in the video, that it is a great car. That it is Nissan's good offering into the 60 kilowatt hour club. Um, after I did, released that show, I came across a video uh, of a test that was done by uh, guys called Next Move. Uh, it's a company in Germany, and they are they they deal with a lot of electric cars. I think they're primarily in that business in either renting or leasing or something along those lines uh, for that. Um, but they they got a very early European version of the Leaf Plus and put it to a rapid gate type test. Now these uh, these guys at Next Move um, in Germany uh, did a more extreme where they drove 500 kilometers in one day, stayed overnight, and came back 500 kilometers for a thousand or so kilometer trip, and purposely had two rapid charges stops um, planned for the Leaf Plus, and their temperatures were in the 25 C to 30 degree C range, so 77 Fahrenheit to 86 Fahrenheit. And I'm not going to get into all the details because you can certainly go and watch their video. But what was surprising was that they experienced very similar BMS throttling as in the 40 kilowatt version, um, which was a surprise to me because they were they they were able to get the battery temperatures up, but not as not as high as you would in 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 a 40 kilowatt hour version. First of all, and then um, the uh, Leaf Plus seemed to activate, seemed to um, behave in a very similar manner to the 40 kilowatt from a DC fast charging. You know, they were only originally able to pull around 44, which is what I experienced, and then. Subsequent charges dropped down to 24 kilowatts and even below that as they got the temperature up. So um, it was fairly much more different than my experience on it. I can tell you that, um, you know, they pushed the car a little bit, you know, doing some auto bomb. They eased off. So I won't get again to the details. You can go watch the video. But, you know, it seems that there's still there's still maybe something with the Leaf Plus. Um, even though it does have the longer range. So your your frequency for charging is going to be less. Uh, requirement than on the 40 kilowatt it still may suffer from from the battery throttling uh, safety mechanism that Nissan puts in there so the jury is still loud I encourage you to check out the video and I'll keep watching for more reviews and more insights into this um, it doesn't change my opinion for the Leaf Plus I felt I still think it's a great capable all-around all-electric uh, battery electric vehicle um, for extensive road tripping, I would say at this point, if that data holds that it may not be the best choice, considering that there are others out there, but certainly for urban or shorter road tripping, if you're going to do, you know, a, a trip where you just have to stop once to fast charge, you know, maybe drive for two, 200 kilometers to 220 kilometers to 50 kilometers or so, stop, charge, and then go to your destination, you're done. Something like that, it'd be a perfect car for as well. Uh, for doing much more serious road tripping than that, there may be better choices out there with uh, other uh, models that do have active cooling. Now, it doesn't mean that the Leaf Plus or even the 40 kilowatt won't do the journeys. They will, as I've said all along, especially on the 40, it'll just, it can, could take you a lot longer than the nor that you would be willing to spend to do that journey. So, you know, as I said to folks, um, Nissan's chosen this path with, with the Leaf, the Leafs anyway, in a passive a cooling, a passive thermal management, um, the way approach to all electric vehicles. That's their choice. They've rolled out a product. They do need to continue to better educate customers and qualify, as I've been saying all along. So I do do strongly believe in that. 
but I still strongly believe that the Leaf has a great fit in the use cases that it can do very well in. Just because a car maybe can't can't do as well as a Model 3 or a Nero or a, a Kona for longer trip uh, driving doesn't mean it's not suitable for for people, period. Uh, I think the Leaf is a great option for the use cases that it will support very well. Like my case where 99% of my driving is well within the daily limit of even my 40 kilowatt version. Even in the heat that we're experiencing now here in the in southern Ontario, we're in the 35, 40 degrees Celsius, 42 degrees Celsius humidex heat right now for the last week or so. I'm still having no problems in my daily range. And in fact, I'm not even having to charge it up every night. I can go two or three days without charging it, even running the AC. So, you know, there are use cases that it's acceptable for this product. And I don't want, you know, people to get too carried away that uh, the Leaf isn't a good fit because it does fit, but it may not fit for many use cases. And that's the importance of doing things like what I do and what you folks, a lot of you folks uh, comment and, and message me about education and people that you talk to. And that's what this is about is to, is to educate those people that aren't aware of what EVs can provide and let them know what choices are out there. So, you know, stay tuned for, for follow up information on the plus. I'll continue to monitor this. And uh, if I get any more concrete data, you know, it was a one test and some of the data it was it wasn't done very well. They didn't kind of display the data very well. I would have liked if they would have charted it and done a better job of explaining it. At one point, they didn't have any data. They could have read it off a of leaf spy and they didn't. I don't know. So it was a little rough around the edges. Uh, but I'm sure that more info will come out and uh, we'll be able to update you on that. So on this on the subject of charging, let me switch gears to talk about Tesla superchargers quickly. We're getting uh, getting many more reports now that I'm reading about the version three uh, that's out there for the superchargers. You know, and it, I've said it all along, you know, Tesla's done done it right. You know, they've built the infrastructure to support the EVs from day one. You know, it's costly, and they've had to charge a premium by selling premium vehicles, but they're doing it, and they continue to upgrade that, which I think is vastly important. Uh, to support uh, the ongoing sales and especially, you know, uh, the, the multitude of Model 3s. They just had a record quarter, which is great. Fantastic. Congratulations for Tesla. I'm glad that they're doing very well. I'm seeing lots and lots more Teslas on the road. And uh, what what will make their Tesla owners' lives even better is the version 3 of the supercharger, where they're now pumping up the 250 kilowatts of power that you're able to draw from these stations and uh, read an article about an experience where somebody has come in with a Model 3 and now the cabling I understand is, is thinner than the older cabling uh, and it's actually liquid cooled of course because now when you start pushing those ultra fast charging speeds you need some cooling mechanisms for the cables um, but they were able to actually pull out the full 250 kilowatts of power on the on a Model 3 that translated into what they quote as a mind numbing, and I totally agree with that, 1,722 kilometers or 1,070 miles per hour charging speed. That's correct, over a thousand miles per hour for charging, folks. That's astounding. Now. Real world, nobody has a thousand mile limit vehicle, uh, electric battery vehicle yet. May come, who knows? We'll see. But in the real world, that translates to about 286 kilometers or 170 miles in 15 minute charging. And as I've said in many shows in the past, including when Trevor and I were doing the Model 3 shows, when you can get that charging experience down to that 15 minute, 10, 15 minute range, 15 I think is a sweet spot. It, it, it just takes that another hurdle away from EV adoption because that's, you know, that's something I hear, well, I got to stop. I got to wait half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to 80%, whatever, you know, the way Tesla is moving. And I should say the industry as a whole is moving there with Fastnet and Electrify US, uh, America, Electrify Canada, and all these other providers that are popping up with ultra fast networks that they're going to spread out over the next several years. We're moving to that situation of a 15 minute type of stop where um, where you can charge up adequately enough to get you going to the next destination relatively quickly. And, and there's no excuse, there's no barrier when it comes to charging for EV adoption. So that's that's fantastic that Tesla has been able to get those out. More and more of those uh, 350 are popping up uh, or the 250 are, are popping up all over the place. So just check out their maps and go from there. But congratulations for Tesla for getting that out. And it's great to hear some real life feedback on this stuff. Now announcement came out from BMW. Uh, they've made, made a few announcements over the last year or so, but now they've kind of tweaked something they said a little while ago where 
um, they've announced that they're going to uh, offer even more vehicles into the electrification realm. Um, BMW Group, of course, uh, has the BMW brand and the Mini brand under their threshold, and they're now going to target 25 electrified models, and that includes battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles by 2023. So that's only about four short years from now, and that's two years earlier than they had originally targeted, which is 2025. What they currently have from a full battery only perspective is the i3, the i3s, the i8 coupe and the i8 roadster. That's what they have today. They have some hybrid and electrified versions, some plug-in hybrid versions as well as so other models, which I won't read. But uh, what's certainly coming up uh, in the near future is the Mini Electric, of course. I've talked about that on previous shows. That should be coming out at the end of this year. They, they may even start shipping before the end of 2019, but certainly into Q1 of 2020. That'll be produced at the uh, Oxford plant in the UK. And then uh, Brexit was standing, of course. <laughs> I don't see that changing. And then uh, some additional, uh, the next fifth drive generation systems, as BMW calls it, with the iX3 due in 2020. That'll be their first all-electric vehicle that'll be produced in China. Uh, from Shenyang, China, and then they'll also have the iNext, which will be coming from Germany in 2021, and another German-produced vehicle, the i4, in 2021. So those are in the near future or on the horizon, and then they've got some concepts that they've put out with the M Next and the Motorrad Vision DC Roadster. So um, that's what BMW is doing. Again, as I always say, the more the merrier to this party. We need everybody. We need every manufacturer looking to crank up millions of vehicles a year, literally, because we have to make a huge dent in this quickly. Um, you know, just making three, four, five 500,000 a year from five or six uh, uh, automakers isn't enough. We really, really, really need to, uh, to make an impact on that 90 plus million sales a year that happen for cars and light trucks and uh, Rivian and Ford and GM and all these guys really need to to be cranking it out, not just one company. So good on BMW. Let's hope we see something relatively soon, especially on these future models. Now, Opel in Europe has uh, launched an, another all-electric vehicle called the Corsa. Uh, there is a gas version and a diesel version of it, but they've launched an all-electric uh, version of this vehicle. Cute looking car. I like the looks of it. Uh, now it comes with 135 horsepower rated 100 kilowatt motor. Uh, giving it also 192 pound-feet or 260 newton meter of torque uh, and it's that torque that snaps your head back when you floor the accelerator uh, giving it an estimated range of 205 miles or 330 kilometers i believe this is nedc ranges so uh, obviously epa is going to be a lot less it's based on a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack um, 0 to 62 miles an hour 100 k kilometers per hour in 8.1 seconds so definitely fast enough to get you up to speed and to uh, surprise people off the light if they're not expecting this car to move um, uh, there's some other uh, specs that you can look up on their website which i won't get into but they're taking orders um, relatively soon I believe around the end of the summer into the early fall to start taking pre-orders for this and they expect uh, core uh, deliveries of the Corsa E as they're calling it by the latter part of this year so uh, I don't have uh, a source of where um, where this is going to ship from um, obviously they're built in Germany and um, those uh, kilometer miles ratings what were WLTP uh, one so yes I was correct in that I'm just trying to read some of the other specs. Um, yeah, they don't say what countries they're going to be initially uh, ready for, but I'm anticipating Europe, at least the main main Europe for now. I'm not sure about the UK, uh, but uh, you can go on their website and look for more information. So great to see another new EV coming to market. Now, I've talked about on many shows, one market I think that's great for electrification is the commercial light vehicle light truck marketplaces and short haul even short to medium haul trucking with where the likes of tesla and um you know daimler's getting into that volvo they're all getting into uh to e-trucks but uh in that smaller fleet you know i've talked about ups and and you know delivery vans and this kind of stuff well fiat doesn't want to be left out and they've got a very popular commercial a van that's used for a lot of small commercial uses called the ducato and they've electrified that for 2020 so it's going to be a full electric version of this model year 2020 van 
Um, it's going to offer be offered in the same body variants that in the same load volumes that you can get today with the diesel version. Um, they expect the range to be anywhere from 220 kilometers or 137 miles to 360 kilometers or 224 miles. I believe that you'll have a choice of battery packs to select to get those different kinds of ranges. These are NEDC cycle, so again, APA will be less. Real world is anticipated at probably around 100 miles or 160 kilometers, you know, which for the short haul delivery kind of, you know, doing deliveries throughout the urban center city or through a, a region, you know, 160 kilometers is fine. And even if you had to stop for, a, a, you know, a half hour fast charge to keep going on your routes, that would be more than adequate for the use case for this. Um, it does talk about a 90 kilometer, 90 kilowatt, excuse me, hour battery, 90 kilowatt power. <laughs> motor i'll get it straight folks so many numbers gets confusing 90 kilowatt motor to give you a peak torque of 280 newton meters and that's important in this because when you load this thing up you want it to at least be able to move get up to highway speeds and whatever now it will be limited speed limited to 100 kilometers per hour or 62 miles an hour to operate to optimize energy use which makes perfect sense you want to be able to get this thing going and as i mentioned it'll handle loads for anywhere from 10 cubic meters to 17 cubic meter for loads from a payload up to 1950 kilograms you can convert that to pounds so uh pictures look great it's a great kind of van for those type of applications either uh you know commercial somebody has a mobile tool shop or or doing deliveries or whatever the case may be you could add components to refrigerate and do other things within that i'm sure so good to see another uh, Fiat going after that slice of the market because apparently their vans do quite well already of the diesel version So let's get rid of that diesel Let's get this uh, fully electric versions replacing those and get them out to market and I hope to start seeing these on the roads I think Fiat's claiming by the end of this year. They'll start some deliveries or into early 2020 Last but not least on today's episode is the Honda E or the Honda's version of their uh, fully electric car the 2020 model year now that prototype that they unveiled and I talked about it a few shows ago is making its rounds through the media circuits I know fully charged got their hands on ones uh, in the last week or so and some other media so I won't spend a lot of time talking about it I'll just some of the feedback that we're hearing from some of the the tests that are going on um, Honda is still saying that this is a prototype but all the feedback both from when it was launched I believe at uh, the Geneva Auto Show if I'm not mistaken or, or one of the other main ones is and, and what are people saying about it is that it's very much feels like a production ready vehicle so if it's a prototype they don't expect much if anything to change on that it's, but you know it does it is a throwback to that smaller honda design from the 70s you know uh, uncle of mine had had, had had i believe it was a 74 civic here in canada with a three-speed or a two-speed tra auto transmission it was kind of weird but it's a great little commuter car went forever on a tank of gas you know just to put putts around the city so this is a bit of a throwback but much more stylish and much more inviting um, it's uh, supposed to have a 35 and a half kilowatt hour battery pack so not too big not too small just the size of Montreal as we say um, good good for about um, 62 miles per hour 0 to 100 in about eight seconds that seems to be the standard in the uh, the, the smaller class of EVs now it's not going to be a cheap vehicle prices uh, are starting Starting to come out that Honda is stating that it should come in around 40,000 euros or 45,000 US dollars uh, uh, based on uh, recent rates um, and it looks like it's just going to come in at about 124 miles of range uh, so you know 200 or so kilometers uh, give or take a few there um, and I'm sure it'll have good charging and thermal management because it is a premium price vehicle at that capacity so I'm sure I don't have any other specs on any of that but it'll give you all the charging to 80 and all that kind of good stuff at uh, at at what Honda does so yeah 148 horsepower output 221 pound-feet of torque uh, rear-wheel drive too that's the other differentiator on this car so it should be fun if you get into some snowy or slippery conditions you might be able to boot that thing around it's a little fun a little better uh, have a little bit more fun on it uh, than usual so great to see that 
Honda is serious. They are out there promoting his vehicle. They anticipate deliveries uh, closer to the end of this year or into, again, early next year as well. I don't have firm dates on that. And if anybody has more details, if you've got a pre-order in from one, I'd love to understand what your experience is so far and what Honda is telling you, where you're from and uh, what region and what kind of feedback you're getting. But uh, it's a great, great looking vehicle. Hope to see more, uh, more news about it uh, in the future. Right, and that's it for episode 50, Big 50 of EV Revolution Show. Thank you very much for watching. Appreciate you taking the time for this quick update show of some of the things going on in the EV Revolution from a global viewpoint. As always, I want to thank everybody for their comments, uh, for subscribing and liking. And uh, if you don't like it, say you don't like it. That's fine by me. Uh, you know, it's uh, we live in a democratic world, uh, a democracy in most places anyway. So you certainly feel to uh, you certainly feel free to express yourself. Uh, obviously, I mentioned before, I, I will take down uh, posts that I feel that are not um, uh, proper let me just put it that way so but I do appreciate comments and I do try to get back to everybody um, my contact information is coming up and also a big thanks to patreon supporters and I want to thank some newer patreon supporters that just jumped on board within the last week I appreciate that support very very much your names will be included in the upcoming uh, patreon thank you roll and again if you're interested in supporting me on patreon even a dollar a month a couple bucks a month doesn't have to be anything big will help it goes a long way to helping me to uh, produce these shows the effort and uh, travel and uh, ah, the, the, the stuff it, it's I'm a one-man band as you folks know so I try to do as much as I can and equip myself as well and uh, continue to learn and better my skills in providing better and quality the content here on the shows uh, i will be doing another car review show this month it's coming up and if you again have feedback please uh, email me don't hesitate for uh, to contact me my information is coming up and again until the next show please everybody stay safe thank you very much for watching and i'll see you when i see you